I like to go back and just refresh our memory <clears throat> because with all kinds of things and that we deal with on a daily basis, sometimes it's hard to remember all of the various things. Of course, uh, the Apostle Paul writing to the Roman church, this is one of his longest and most systematic uh, of his letters, but on page uh, 1194, in the introduction, once again, I want you to see this because I want you to keep it forever in your mind of what we're dealing with in the book of Romans. Romans is the longest and the most systematically reasoned of Paul's letters. Paul announces the theme in chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, and uh, if you'll look down at the bottom of your page, right-hand column, very last verse, for here is, here is the theme, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith, or the KJV says, the just shall live by faith. Now, notice it says in our introduction, Paul announces the theme there, chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, the gospel is God's power for salvation because it shows us that the righteousness of God is through faith for all who believe. So Paul explains the need for justification through faith because of sin. In other words, how that we are, once we receive Christ, we are justified through faith. And uh, just as if we had never sinned. And then he spells out the results of justification by faith in terms of both present experience and future hope in chapters 5, 1 through 8, and verse 39. And of course, in chapter 5, we talked about the importance of the eternal security of the believer, and uh, we talked about the importance of, of all of that. In the next three chapters, which would be 6, 7, and 8, Paul expresses his sorrow that many of his Israelites have not embraced the gospel. And he wrestles with this theological implication of this, and we'll look at that in chapters 9 through 11. He concludes by describing how the gospel should affect one's everyday life, chapters 12 through 16. Paul wrote his letter to, uh, to the Romans in about A.D. 57, and that was just a few years after Jesus died on the cross and was resurrected in A.D., as some say, A.D. 33, and there's uh, differences of opinion on that particular year, but uh, nonetheless, A.D. 33 to A.D. 57 wasn't but about, what, 22 or 3, 4 years, somewhere long in there. And so I just want to go back and refresh your memory. Once we've talked about justification, being made righteous in Christ through faith, in Christ alone, uh, then chapter 6, 7, and 8, he deals with how we live the Christian life, our sanctification, which uh, you and I are being sanctified every day day of life. We're either growing in the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, or we are just not growing in the Word of God like we ought to be growing once we have been justified. We looked at chapter 6 last week, and we got down to about verse number 7. We've talked about, I mean, excuse me, in chapter 7, we've talked about we've been released from the law. Now, Jesus said he didn't come to destroy the law, but he came to fulfill the law. What was the law for to begin with? You see, before the law was ever given, uh, they did not understand all the things about uh, their sin. Yet there was still sin in the world which brought forth death. 
uh, from Adam and Eve's fall and the curse that fell upon the world that you and I live in. But when the Mosaic law came into being, it pointed out the sins of mankind. So the law was used to bring mankind to the realization of the sin that was in his or her life. In chapter 7, we looked uh, at being released from the law. You and I are not under law, we're under grace. And uh, the law uh, reminds us uh, that we were sinners, uh, that we are sinners, that we have either received Christ and we have been justified or else people have not received Christ and they are living in their sinfulness. We got down to verse number 7, chapter 7, page 1200. So let's begin here and finish chapter 7 for this evening. One of the things that I think is very difficult uh, for people to uh, sometimes confuse in their hearts and lives and I think it's the whole deal about living in the flesh or living by the Spirit. Uh, as, as a person, you and I, uh, if we've been saved, we, are, we have the Holy Spirit living within us. And it's the Holy Spirit that empowers us. It's the Holy Spirit that enables us to live the Christian life. You and I could not live the Christian life on our own. You and I could not live the Christian life probably five minutes in a day because we're in a fleshly body and I can assure you, knowing humanity as well as I think I know it after all of my soon to be 73 years. Wow, that sounds terrible. Uh, but anyway, nonetheless, with all of the psychology classes that I've had in tons of them, and two master's level of them, I, I think I understand human psychology pretty well. But I, I know the fact that all of us live in a fleshly, sinful body. It's a body that's not been redeemed yet. It will not be redeemed until one of these days when the call comes from heaven and the dead in Christ are, are raised. And that corruptible body that went into the ground will be raised an incorruptible body, meaning that it will not ever be corrupted ever again. Uh, it will be a spiritual body rejoined with the spirit that went to God when that person left this life. So that spirit will be rejoined with that body, that resurrected body someday. You and I uh, if we are alive at that time when the clarion call from heaven comes for the church to be raptured out of here, the Bible says we who are alive uh, will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye and we'll be caught up together with them uh, to meet them in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And so the Bible says wherefore because of that, in other words, comfort each other with these words. But as long as you and I are in this present world that we live in, we are not safe from Satan's attacks upon our life. Life is a trial. Life is filled with tribulations. Life is a battleground. Would you believe that tonight? Life is a battleground. We are battling demonic sources, powers that are out there principalities and powers, and uh, we are attacked by Satan on a daily basis. Uh, if we've been saved, then the Holy Spirit lives within us. And the Bible says your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we ought to ask ourselves the question, would I take the Holy Spirit into a place that would not be edifying to the Holy Spirit. Would I, would I do that as a Christian? You see, you either allow the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to guide you each day of life, or you are being directed by the power of your flesh. 
And the Bible says those two are contrary to each other. Whichever one you feed the most is the, ones that's the one that is going to win out. Now, I realize that when the Apostle Paul wrote, wrote to the Corinthian church, there was a lot of um, carnality in the Corinthian church, which is just a picture of churches all over the world. Lots of carnality in churches. Lots of carnal people who walk not by the Spirit, provided they have the Spirit of God in their life. I've uh, repeated over and over and over, you know, the Bible says that uh, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to heaven. Not everyone that says, Lord, Lord. But he that does the will of the Father, which is in heaven. So the Bible says that one of these days, people will say, Lord, we cast out demons. We did this. We did that. Jesus will say, depart from me. You that work iniquity, I never knew you. So there's lots of people who are professors, but possessing is a whole nother issue. You either are a professing, possessing person who has received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, or else you are either being duped uh, by Satan to make you believe that you have been saved. I just believe that people who truly love God, want to live for God, want to serve God, I, I think there ought to be a change in a person's life. I, I, where do I get that? The Bible says that we are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. I just believe that we can know people by the fruits. Now, that's not to say that many times in life we slip back into that old pattern of trying to walk in the power of the flesh. And so that's why it's so vitally important in our sanctification, that is our daily walk being separated, set apart from the world, living for Jesus, growing in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I really believe that's why you find so many people who profess that they're Christians, and I'm not saying that they're not, only God knows. He's the great cardionostis, the heart knower. But what I am saying is, I think there's a lot of people that do not live up to John 10:10 10, 10, when Jesus said, I've come to give you life and to give it abundantly. And I think there's a lot of people that do not live the abundant life. The abundant, let me ask you a question tonight. Are you living the abundant life? Are you living the joyful life? I, I love that song we sing. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Save, spread the tidings all around. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. I believe that if we are saved, we ought to have some joy in our hearts and life. I'm not saying that we have to be happy all the time. There's a difference in happiness and joy. Happiness happens to deal with your happenstances in life, things that come your way, things that, that uh, cause discouragement and, and cause you to feel downcast. No wonder the psalmist said, why art thou downcast, O my soul? The happenstances of life but there ought to be joy in the heart of a Christian. And the joy of the Lord is what? My strength. The joy of the Lord. We ought to have joy in our hearts. Now, we may feel downcast. We may feel that because of happenings in our lives that challenge us and even sometimes challenge our faith with the why questions that we've been looking at on Sunday morning for the past two weeks. But you see, I, I think there ought to be joy. The joy of the Lord is what? My strength. 
Who am I counting on? Am I counting on my flesh? Am I counting on the power of the Holy Spirit that lives within me? And so we're challenged in our everyday lives. Am I walking in the power of the Holy Spirit or am I walking in the power of my flesh? And when people walk in the power of their flesh, the Holy Spirit is not operating as the Holy Spirit wants to operate in the heart and the life of a professing Christian. And so in our justification, the moment we get saved, we are justified by the righteousness of Christ. That's how we are justified. Uh, the just shall live how? By faith. By faith. Uh, there's an old song that says, Is it, I care not today what tomorrow may bring, if shadow or sunshine or rain. The Lord I know watches over me and all of my worry is vain, living by faith in Jesus alone. Uh, and so we're either living by faith, walking by faith, or else we're walking in our fleshly bodies and we're not allowing the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to lead us, to guide us, to direct us in all that we do. And so Paul has uh, told these Romans, he has uh, shared in verse number seven, once they've been justified, now how should they live? And we see in chapter six and in chapter seven, chapter seven were released from the law. In fact, Martha, let's just back up to verse one, if we could, of Romans chapter seven. Let's just go ahead and go through this entire chapter for this evening. Paul says, or do you not know, brothers, for I'm speaking to those who know the law that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. Verse number two, he goes on for a married woman, and he uses this analogy. He uses an illustration here about the law. For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives. Okay, so we know the marriage laws of the land, okay? But if her husband dies, she's released from the law of marriage. In other words, he's deceased, he's gone, she's not bound by that marital law. Notice the next verse. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. Okay? So, He's illustrating this issue of, of, of law here. Verse number four. And we'll just follow these verses on down. Verse number four. But if her husband, three, but if her husband dies, she's free from that law. And if she marries another man, she's not an adulteress. Verse number four. Likewise, he says, brother, my brothers, you also have died, what? To the law. How? through the body of Christ. Why? So that you may belong to another. Let's look at that verse again. I think it's important. So he gives the analogy of the, the, the person married. As long as that person is married to that spouse, if that spouse is still living, they're married. If that one of those spouses die, if the a husband is dead, that wife is free from that law of marriage. They have completed their marriage contract, their marriage vows. And then it said, if it, but, but if he dies, uh, or what did it say in verse number uh, number three, Martha, back on three, if you will. But if her husband dies, she's free from that law. And if she marries another man, she's not an adulteress. Verse number four, likewise, my brothers, now here's where he's going to make this analogy. You also have died to what? The law. Through the body of Christ. In other words, you're no longer under law. You've died from this old life and you've received and you've put on Christ. And so you've, you're free from the law. You also have died to the law through the body of Christ. That's how we're free from the law because of what Christ did at Calvary and through the resurrected Christ and when we receive Christ so that you may belong to another. Who's he referring to? That you will belong to Christ. 
Now, notice, if you will, in verse number, uh, the part, rest of that, to him who has been raised from the dead, that's who you belong to once you're free from the law and have received Christ, he says, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may what? Bear fruit for God. I believe one of the reasons that so many people who profess that they're Christians, and yet they're so downcast all the time. I think uh, the reason that they have lost, they have lost what they didn't need to lose, and that's their joy. They've lost their joy. How many Christians are bearing fruit in their Christian life? I believe that is the reason so many are unhappy I think that is why so many of them uh, live in a state not of the abundant life, but I think they live in a life where uh, uh, th they know they're not living like they should. They know they're not working for the Lord like they should. They know that they're not pointing to people to Jesus like they should, and so uh, they're discouraged, they're downcast, and uh, I, I think the way you get yourself out of the doldrums of life is you, you start doing things to point people to Jesus through the Christian life, through our sanctification as we are being sanctified every day of our lives, to reach out to help someone else. Uh, you know, there was a song many years ago, I remember hearing it, if I can help somebody as I pass along, then my living will not be in vain. Now, he says there in verse number four, and I want to go back and I want to read it, likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law. How do we do that? Through the body of Christ. Why did we do that? so that you may belong to another. Who is that another? To him who has been raised from the dead. Why? In order that we may bear fruit for God. Let me ask you a question tonight. Are you a fruit-bearing Christian? Are you a fruit-bearing Christian? Does your life point out, if other people looked at you, would they see fruits in your life? And I really believe with all my heart that in this thing called sanctification and growing in the, the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and living for Jesus, a life that is pleasing, I really believe that's why so many people are stagnant in their Christian life. I believe that's why so many people are not happy. And I think it's simply because they know that they're not living the abundant life that Jesus came to give. And so, once we are in Christ, what are we to do? Bear fruit for God. How do I bear fruit? What is fruit bearing? What does that look like? Well, number one, there's lots of things that are fruits for Jesus. Amen? You may be teaching a class. You may be a cook, cooking food uh, to take someone. You may be writing notes of encouragement. You may be texting words of encouragement. You may be uh, handing out tracts or leaving tracts wherever you go. You may be visiting the sick, visiting those that are confined to nursing homes and, and assisted living centers. You may be uh, doing a myriad of things, sharing Jesus, sharing your faith, what Christ has done for me. To bear fruit, what does that fruit bearing do? So that others may see your good works and what? Glorify your Father who is in heaven. And so we're either fruit bearers or once we get to heaven, if we've truly been saved, but we just, uh, we never rejected, but we never really grew in our walk with the Lord. Let me tell you, when he hands out rewards, whatever those are going to be, whatever those crowns are going to consist of, there are going to be a lot of people that won't have any works. Their works will be burned up. They were either done for the wrong reason, they were done for recognition, look at me, look at what I did, uh, or you know, I like uh, to not let your left hand know what your right hand does. 
or this is your left hand, your right hand. <laughs> so, you know, bearing fruit, bearing fruit. And uh, I know we say judge not lest we be judged and we're not supposed to judge. But I'll tell you, you can look at a person's life and you can tell what kind of fruit bearer they are. Just this past week, one day driving down the road, and I don't know what the situation was, a thousand things come into my mind because they're coming in all different directions about different people, different issues, things that are going on in their life. And immediately, Joe Allen popped into my mind. If any of you remember Joe Allen, brother Dan Pruitt's sister, Joe was an incredible uh, Bible scholar. A Sunday school teacher. She studied the Word of God religiously. And uh, I, I can remember many people that were in her Sunday school class. She had a ladies' class. And uh, I, I can remember uh, them talking about Joe and the time and the effort that she put into teaching and, and what that class meant to each one of them. And immediately in my mind, driving down the road, I, I immediately thought of her. Talk about a fruit bearer. She was a fruit bearer for Jesus. And the question, I guess, tonight, one of the takeaways for you and me is this. Am I bearing fruit for Jesus that will point other people to look to him? Notice in verse number five. For while we were living in the flesh, now he's talking about uh, before we became a Christian. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. And so he's speaking about before we realized that we needed Jesus and we're living out there this iniquitous life or our sinful life and letting the passions of our life which, which uh, bear fruit for death. Then he goes on in verse number six and he says, but now, but now, Roman Christians, but now we are released from the law having died to that which held us captive. The law held them captive. Why? Because the law could not save. The law wasn't intended for them to be saved by the law because none of them could keep the law. There was not one of them that could keep the law. They could never measure up to the standards of the law and so, God sent a way for redemption through his son Jesus. But now, we're released from the law having died to that which held us captive so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Speaking there about the law. Verse number seven. What then shall we say? that the law is sin, and Paul says, by no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. Sin pointed out man's sinfulness. It's what he's saying there. And Paul said, had it not been for the law, I, I would not have known sin. Go on in the rest of that verse. For I would not have known what it is to covet. In other words, do you remember uh, the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt not covet. Remember that? So Paul uses an example here. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said you shall not covet. And so the law was the instrument through which God used to point out the sins to mankind. Verse number eight. But sin, Paul says, seizing an opportunity through the commandment produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. In other words, it was the law that he realized what covetousness was all about. 
uh, verse number nine. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. Paul was saying, once I realized through the law that pointed out sin to me, Paul said, I became alive and I, what? I died. I died to an old way of life. I died to my sin and Christ nailed my sins on the cross. And so he says, sin came alive and I died. Verse number 10, the very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. Verse number 11, for sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. Once again, he's speaking about sin and, and the commandments pointing that, those out. Verse number 12, so the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. So what Paul is doing here, he's, he's showing the importance of what the law was all about. But once Christ came and offered salvation through faith, God's wonderful gift of grace, then the law uh, was no longer uh, needed uh, I'm not under law. The law was needed to point out sin, but now I'm under grace because my sins have been forgiven by receiving Christ as my Lord and Savior. So the law, he says, is holy. He speaks about the importance of the law there, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. And he was speaking, remember, a few moments ago about the law of covetousness and those various things. Verse number 13, did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin. He's speaking sin brought death, producing death in me through what is good. And then he goes on and he says, in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. Verse number 14, he goes on and he gives us, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I'm of the flesh sold under sin. Verse 15, for I do not understand my own actions. I, I love what Paul says here. Paul speaking about, he said, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Let's stop there for a minute. Let me ask you a question. How many of us catch ourselves doing the very things that we hate? If we're honest, we all do, don't we? At some point in our Christian walk, Paul said, for I do not understand my own actions. Paul realized how very powerful the flesh is. And the flesh wants to override the spirit in our lives. And Paul said, for I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Let me ask you a question. Do you do that? Do I do that? Look at verse number 16. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. Verse number 17, we'll just follow these verses all the way through. So now it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me. That is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. I want to stop there for a second. How do you and I live the Christian life? None of us can live it. We have to let the Holy Spirit live it through us. It's the Holy Spirit that gives us power to live each day, to enable us, to empower us, to let our spirit override our fleshly passions and desires. And I love that Paul, he's just, you know, this is where the rubber meets the road. He's just honest. 
He said, for I know that nothing good dwells in me. When you get to thinking you're really good, you better go back and think again. Paul said, for I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what's right, but not the ability to carry it out. Notice what he said in verse 19. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. You see, do you understand why people become so disheartened and so discouraged in their Christian faith? You can't live it. I can't live it. But the Holy Spirit can live it through us when we give the Holy Spirit its indwelling, uh, its infilling every single day. You're indwelt with the Spirit if you are saved tonight. And your indwelling Spirit wants you to be filled with the Spirit every day, to let the Spirit move you, walk with you, talk with you, make decisions for you. And Paul was talking about the flesh, how the, you know, the power of the flesh is so strong. I've heard people say many years ago, well, I would trust Christ, but I can't live the Christian life. Well, I don't know anybody that can. The only way we can live it is let the Holy Spirit live it through us. But I remember that old song, I will arise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms, in the arms of my dear Savior. Oh, there are 10,000 charms. And there's a verse that says, if you tarry, in other words, if you wait to get saved, if you tarry till you're better, the writer says you will never come at all. Why? because there's no good thing within my flesh. And so the whole difference here is, do I live in the power of the Holy Spirit every day of my life, or do I allow the flesh to override my spirit? And when I do that, Paul is just letting you know how he felt. He said, the things I do are the things I don't want to do. They're the things I hate. The things I want to do are not the things that I do. And it's all because of, am I walking in the flesh or am I walking in the spirit? And I dare say tonight, of all of the people in the world that profess that they know Jesus, it would be a minuscule percentage, I believe, of the ones that truly walk in the power of of the Holy Spirit in field each day. And I think that's why we have so much disgrumblement, disgrumblement in our churches. I think that's why we have, you know, other than what Satan tries to do to wreck them, but I think that's why so many people get out of sync and get out of arms. No, I want red carpet. No, I want green carpet. No, I want blue carpet. No, I want padded pews. No, I'd rather have chairs. Uh, no, I'd rather have the old hymns. No, I don't like the contemporary. You, you know, I, I think it's, am I letting the Holy Spirit direct me today? I may not particularly like a song, or it may not particularly minister to me, but I'm confident of the fact that God is using it for someone. It may be a young person that God is using it for. It, it, it doesn't always have to be for me. We live in a me, 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 me generation. And we feel entitled. And that's what's the matter with the world tonight. We feel entitled and, and, and I, I think Paul is just being honest here. He's just saying, you know, I, I'm writing this through the Holy Spirit. I'm not writing it. I'm just pinning it. The Holy Spirit's giving it. But I just want you guys to know, Paul is saying, hey, I've, I found out that there's nothing good in me that, that my flesh 
wants to override my spirit, and many times it does, and many times it has. I, I, I wonder what a church would look like if every person in every pew were indwelt by the Spirit and then infilled with the Spirit. Can you only imagine what we would see happen? Souls that we'd see born into the kingdom. I don't know about you, but when I think about standing before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords someday, and I have to stand all on my own, you won't have to stand for me, I won't have to stand for you. I'll be standing on my own. I don't know about you, but it gives me pause so often in my life. Uh, and I don't mind to say it frightens me because I think, Lord, have I done my best? Have I given my best to you? Have I done all that I can do? Not that it adds to my salvation, but it points people to Jesus because of the fruits of the labors of what I do for you. I love that Paul just gets down where everybody lives and just Paul said, there's nothing good in me, nothing good in my flesh. The things I don't want to do and the things I hate are sometimes what I do. And how many of us are like that? We either let the Holy Spirit lead us, live through us, work through us, speak through us, point people to Jesus through us, or we're walking in the power of our flesh. And that's why you and I can't live it. We have to let the Holy Spirit live it in us and through us. Verse number 20. Now, if I do what I do not want, it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Verse 21. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. Any of y'all ever tried to do the right thing? For all the right reasons, but it backfired. Any of y'all ever been there, done that? My goodness gracious, I've set up camp there. When I would do good, evil is present. And let me tell you, the devil is alive and well, and he uses people. He'll use people in your congregation. I like what Dan Pruitt always said. If you don't think the devil won't come up and sit on the front row on Sunday morning and amen you, and then he'll put a knife through you before the day's over, he said, you're sadly mistaken. And he'll use Christian people to do it. He'll use other people to make a comment, to make a remark, to make a statement, and cuts to the very bone. Any of y'all know what I'm talking about? Uh, I mean, any, any of y'all ever had that happen to you? And, and the sad part about it is, the person that the devil is using in that moment, who's not walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, is sinning in their own flesh. That's why it's so vitally important that each of us realize that we're in a spiritual warfare. It's a spiritual battle. And it's a battle every morning and every day that you and I wake up. The real deal is, am I smart enough? Do I have the wisdom of God enough to recognize enough what I'm doing and what I'm not doing? Verse number 22 says, for I delight, Paul says, for I delight in the law of God in my inner being. Do you delight tonight in the law of God in your inner being? His commandments, his precepts, his principles. But I see, Paul said, but I see in my members, he's talking about his body, another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive, what? To the law of sin that dwells where? In my members. He's referring to the fact, guys and gals, we're all flesh, blood and bone. And as long as we're in this fleshly body 
you're not, you are not immune to the devil using you in a negative way. As long as we're in this natural, fleshly body. But the good point is, I have the Holy Spirit who dwells in me. So do I allow the Holy Spirit to guide me, to lead me, to direct me? Or do I just get in the power of my flesh? As one old preacher said many years ago, during the days of the horse and the buggy, I heard about this many years ago. An old preacher was riding his horse one day and there's a, a, a guy that met up on his horse and he was mad and just began to bless the preacher out. The old preacher said, bless God, I'm just going to dismount this horse, lay my Bible down and I'm going to whip you and then I'm going to get back on my horse and, with my Bible and ride away. But how many of us, I don't think any of y'all got that. Think about that when you leave tonight. How many of us live life that way? When I would do good, evil is there. Evil's present. And the devil will use you. The devil will use me to get us off track, to say the wrong thing, to do the wrong thing, to be critical. I love it when people say, I want to give you some constructive criticism. Well, you know, I, I've been to college. I, I have three degrees plus, and, and I've taught school, and I've never found any constructive criticism. It's always destructive to me. So it may be constructive to you, but it isn't to me. And so... You know, we used to say, be careful, little mouth, what you say. Why? The Father's up above, looking down to me in love. So be careful, little tongue, what you say. And none of us, none of us are immune from Satan using us to discourage some of us. Let's look at the last verse, and I will shut up. Okay? Number 24. I love Paul. Paul said, wretched man that I am. No wonder the writer of Amazing Grace said, who saved a wretch like me. Paul said, he himself is a wretched man. Wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? And then notice verse 25. He gives the answer, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh, I serve the law of sin. Paul saying to those Christians, you're living in the flesh, but you have the Holy Spirit. Who are you going to serve? Would you stand as we pray together tonight? Father, Thank you for this time of Bible study. Thank you for these good people. Thank you for their attentiveness. And Father, I pray that we could be reminded of how we are to live our Christian lives so that it might not disqualify, but it might point others to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Take each one safely home. Return us back on Sunday, I pray. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. Go back and get your directories, but don't read them while you're driving, okay? <laughs>